I wish Carl was this one. Seven oh two. Ready to go. I'm going to call the City Council Caucus meeting to order for May 12th, 2014. If the clerk would read the first item on the agenda. Under final consideration, a local law renaming a portion of Norwood Avenue after Mike Mayada. Now, Mr. Polster, there was a question with this. Do we need to do a roll call vote or can it be on the consent agenda? This one can be on well, Tuesday. Hmm? It's going, to, uh, it's going to be presented out of order anyway. So oh, that's right. Okay. Okay. That's right. I'm sorry. This is going to be presented out of order. Mr. Riggi, you'll make that presentation. Okay. Item number two. Item number two, an ordinance establishing a moratorium on convenience stores. Discussed in committee numerous times without objection on consent. Item number three. Item number three, a resolution adopting the 2014-15 consolidated plan. Roll call. Item number four, a resolution authorizing an agreement regarding the Oak Street Bridge. Also discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number five. Item number five, a resolution authorizing the city to enter into a consent order with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number six. Item number six, a resolution calling for the, a public hearing regarding the New York State Consolidated Funding Application. Also discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number seven. Item number seven, a resolution authorizing an intermunicipal agreement with the Metroplex Authority and the Schenectady IDA relative to a number of Eastern Avenue properties. Discussed in committee without objection on consent. Item number eight. Item number eight, a resolution authorizing the city of Schenectady to settle a claim by Michelle L. LeDuc. Discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number nine. Item number nine, a resolution authorizing the city of Schenectady to settle a claim by K. Chase Larzellery. <laughs> Discussed in claims without objection on consent. Mm -hmm. Item number 10. Item number 10, a resolution authorizing the settlement of a claim brought by Mark Lynch. Also discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number 11. Item number 11, a resolution authorizing the settlement of a tax certiorari concerning 202 Front Street. Also discussed in claims without objection on consent. Item number 12. Item number 12, a resolution in support of the New York State Abandoned Property Relief Act of 2014. Also discussed in committee, Ms. Porterfield, did you get, are you satisfied with the, your questions? Well, actually, I didn't um, get anything yet, unless I just didn't get my email. So I was wondering if Mr. Polster could just clarify this for us. Okay. It, it did come, it did get sent out an email. Okay. Um, but Mr. Polster, can you just clarify again? The resolution that's on tonight is uh, a request from actually the Attorney General's office with respect to making a number of changes uh, relative to the responsibility of banks for properties where the mortgage is in default. Uh, as the law stands currently, the law requires that a bank after foreclosure take over uh, responsibility for the property. And the specific legislation that came in uh, concerns basically those specific issues uh, of what the bank has to do uh, before there is foreclosure but after the property is in default by it was either three or four months. Uh, simultaneously there are a number of other bills 
where Wade Beltramo, the general counsel for the New York State Conference of Mayors, came over to Schenectady. He, went, he has gone to a number of municipalities, but uh, came to Schenectady to discuss those bills with the mayor, a uh, number of members of the administration, and myself. And the bills are also designed to help municipalities have uh, more uh, tools to deal with properties that are abandoned. And um, for instance, right now the abandoned property procedure only applies to residential property. And uh, one of the bills has it applying to, in addition to residential property, uh, applying to commercial and vacant properties. Uh, there were a no number of other issues, manners of service and uh, procedural issues. And uh, what I have done in the resolution that is before you, uh, all of the language that was requested uh, or discussed by the Attorney General's office, plus additional language indicating support for everything, both what the Attorney General's office is doing and what uh, New York State Conference of Mayors is attempting to accomplish. So what's before you has language for both. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Erickson? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I'm not necessarily opposed because it may sound, you know, anything that says Relief Act I think would, is generally a good idea, but I haven't had time to review it. I think we, as of yesterday, I hadn't received the, the details. And so if they were sent today, haven't had time to look at them. Is this a time sensitive issue where we need to move on it today or we're not looking to block it because I think it's probably a good thing. I just would feel awkward voting on it, not really knowing the, you know, what we're asking the banks to do differently, right? Mr. Mayor. These are issues that have all been out since really since December that NICOM has put forth. It's the Conference of Mayors and Municipal Officials, they've sent stuff to the council, to the city, yeah. and it's yeah, I haven't received it, so maybe it's just I'm the only one that hasn't uh, received it then. Well, I mean, I could abstain from it. I, mean, I don't want to block it, right? But I just would feel awkward voting on it, not knowing okay. what it is. All right. So we'll make a roll call vote. Um, roll call? Sure. All right. And item number 13. <clears throat> Item number 13, a resolution recognizing Schenectady High School youth. Okay, that will also be taken out of order, and Mr. Kozier will present that. All right, if there's nothing else to come before the City Council Caucus, I'll entertain, yeah, yeah. excuse me, oops. Consent. Oh, okay, we have one additional item then, the clerk would read that. Okay, for unanimous consent, a resolution recognizing Gail Valkenberg. Yes, she is retiring from Sikkim, so. Okay, Mr. Kozier moves it, Mr. Mutavaran seconds it. All in favor? Aye. Okay, opposed? Good, thank you. All right, now I will entertain a motion then to uh, adjourn. Mr. Riggi, seconded by Ms. Porterfield. All in favor? Aye. All right, I will now call the City Council meeting to order for May 12th, 2014, and ask you all to rise for the invocation given by the Reverend Bill Levering from the First Reformed Church. This is the uh, first invocation since the uh, Supreme Court of the United States of America has declared that it is legal by a vote of five to four for uh, prayers to be said at city council meetings. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-loving God be with us, be with our courts, our legislatures, our administrators as we try to do and work for the common good. Be with us all at all levels of government so that we might strive for what is true, work for what is just and live for what is right. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. I'll ask Marva Isaacs to lead us, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, if the clerk would call the roll. Ms. Perrazzo? Present. Ms. Porterfield? Here. Mr. Erickson? Here. 
Mr. Kosher? Here. Mr. Mr. Riggi? Here. Mr. Mudavaran? Present. Ms. King? Present. All right, the so first out of order resolution, or, or at, rather, before that rather, is the um, presentation on the Steinmetz Career Center. Mr. Kosher? Thank you, uh, President King. Let's go. Whoa. Lower the microphone. <laughs> if I may ask the students and staff from uh, the Steinmetz Career Center, come on in. Come inside the rail here, please. We're going to change up the format just a little bit, uh, as with uh, Deputy Clerk uh, Chad Putman has been doing, bringing in small businesses once a month. We are actually going to bring in our youth, who are our future small businesses. And uh, we have before us uh, the staff and some of our students uh, with the Steinmetz Career and Leadership Academy. And if I can introduce the principal, Mr. Gregory Fields, and he'll be uh, able to introduce the rest of our students and staff. Good evening, and I thank you for recognizing my, our school and our students. And I'm going to have Mr. James Keogh, who is the teacher for, uh, and for the program and who coordinates the CAD program, and to introduce some of our students from our CTE program. Thank you for having us. Um, the, I'm actually going to hand it right over to the kids right away. These, these are kids representing all four of our career pathways, but they're going to talk about that when they go through their slideshow. Uh, it's Brenda Parker, Caitlin Charbonneau, um, Selena Truex, and Yashmini Supersad, and they're an uh, excellent cross-section. A lot of times we hear nothing but the bad of kids. These are four of the best kids in our school. Hi, um, we're students from Steinmetz Korean Leadership Academy. Um, I'm Yashmini Siprasad, like Mr. Keo said. I am from the Computer Aided Design and the Office Management course. And I'm Selena Truex, as Mr. Keo said, and I'm from the Media Arts program. Um, my name's Kaylee Charbonneau, and I'm from the Culinary Arts program. And I'm Brenda Parker from the CAD program. <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, there are various classes in the CAD program. Personally, my favorite is CAD Residential Construction. In this class, we get OSHA certified, and that's good because if I'm competing for a job against someone, they'll more than likely pick me because they won't have to pay for a 10-hour uh, OSHA course. <laughs> uh, also, I'd like CAD RC because it's really hands-on and whenever whatever we're doing we always design it on AutoCAD before we actually build it. Explain. These are pictures from our construction program or construction field trip we go on. It's really fun. We got to drive tool or drive machines and work with a whole bunch of construction equipment. Culinary arts, there's a lot of different classes you can take. I'm currently in the Pro Start Culinary Program, which is the fourth year program. We mainly focus on um, where to build a restaurant, how to do it, how to get customers in, what kind of, uh, yeah, what kind of food people are interested in the area, and um, we also take a very big final at the end of the year, which I just took currently last week. It, and um, we do a lot of catering jobs. We've We've catered at the high school, we've catered at our school, we've done a lot. A lot of people, they even order cookies from us and we got to make sometimes five to nine hundred cookies in like two days. So, it's, it's hard. Um, these are a couple of the students working a catering job that we've done. We've, like I said, we do a lot at the high school. Um, on the bottom right hand, that's actually some baklava that one of our teachers made. And uh, it was really good. <laughs> uh, I'm currently in office management right now. I love it because it's, 
it's all business, like makes me feel all professional. But one of my favorite classes is powerful presentation. What that is, it helps you be a better presenter than you already are, already is, and it helps you be, it helps you, it, it helps you with the do's and the don'ts of presenting something like making eye contact, knowing your audience, knowing who you're talking to, and what your message you're trying to send to them. And these are some of the pictures that we took in office management. Yeah. I'm in the media arts program, and for my fourth year, I'm in senior portfolio class. For the first year, I took intro to drawing and intro to computer art, and I enjoyed that a lot because you get experience with drawing, and then you also get experience with using um, the computer program. And the program we use the most is Adobe Photoshop, and I enjoyed that a lot. And choosing this media arts program has actually helped me decide what I want to go to college for. These are some of the kids that are in the program. The two pictures up there are actually two kids that were um, showed in the art show at Rotterdam. Uh, positive things about our school. One main positive thing that I love about our school is that since the school is small, the classes are easier to get to and you get on classes on time. So you don't have to make an excuse, oh, I got lost in the hallways, or I'm sorry, I'm late because I had to walk all the way down the hall. So that's a good thing. The friendly staff is also nice because you, you get one-on-one -on -one with your teacher. You build an actual relationship to where you understand your teacher and they understand you and they get you through the day. And if you're having a hard time pushing yourself, they'll push you. Um, as a student, I personally love it being at Simons because if you're having a problem with a project or you've missed the assignments and you don't know how to do it, your teacher will sit there and tell you, you can, they'll stay after for you any day. They don't care. Like, they'll stay after. You can say you need it two minutes before the, la the, before the last bell rings, and they'll stay after for, with you. Um, and she said, if you give up, throw your paperwork, they'll put it right back on your desk and tell you you can do it. And... Um, we're very... They always believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. You're like, oh, I can't do this, but they're sitting behind you, pushing you forward, saying you can do better. Look at the people around you. You can do better than this, and you can try harder. Yeah, also, it's very easy to learn because the classes are small, so it's very um, interacting, and if you do need help, like Caitlin said, you get it. You don't really have to wait, you know, long to get it. <laughs> These are some of the events that we have catered. We do back to school night, which is where, you know, the parents or new students that want to come check out the school, you can come and we do a whole bunch of things. Career fair um, is where a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of, um, colleges. Yeah, colleges, the businesses. stores, we've had, the Navy, the Army, the military, ShopRite comes, Price Shopper comes. They just inform you about everything they do, and that way if you want to become one of their members. Harvest dinner we did, which was, uh, it was a Thanksgiving thing. We, uh, we cooked a whole bunch of meals and food, and everybody loved it. Business dinner. They prepare you for, like, what you will, what steps you need to know, like certain stuff you need to know when you're having a business dinner, dinner with your boss or employees or with someone of a high profession. They'll tell you what fork to eat with, what glass you need to use, what plate you should use, how you should act, and how you should dress. International night we did a couple weeks ago, and we searched up on Google a whole bunch of international meals. We made them, um, and one of our teachers does the henna tattoos that she did, and you just get to learn about all the different culturals, cultures that may be in the school or maybe somebody you know. Um, field day, that's normally at the end of the year where it's just about half a day where we can just have fun and you got to be good for it though. <laughs> Awards night, uh, that's a night at the end of the year where 
all the students that have had perfect attendance or perfect grades all throughout the year, they all get awards for it, and we normally make like cookies or cupcakes, something like that. Well, our school usually goes on field trips that we love to take pictures on, like a whole bunch of us. So this is the apple picking field trip we went on. We had a lot of fun there. Uh, the construction tour which we went on, uh, we had a lot of fun there. We actually learned how to handcuff people, which was fun because it, it makes you use your aggressive and your anger to do something constructive. Uh, we went on a DOT field trip. Uh, we went to transportation. Um, we learned a lot that you don't need to like be something. You can, how do I put it? There's a lot out there that you can be, even if you don't want to be in the medical field or the business field. There's something else out there for you, and that defines your personality. You can always go and find a job that you'll like and love. A uh, job shadowing field trip is when we go to, like, we went to the police station and uh, the jail and went to court and you get to walk around with one of the persons that work there and their normal routine of their everyday job life, their career life and you get to ask them questions. The one question I love asking is do you consider this a job or a career? A job being you have to do it and a career meaning that you want to do it. So, yeah. Uh, the Vanguard Awards is the recognition of a student pursuing a non-traditional career. Brenda Parker here is the first person in Schenectady to have that award. Well, to win the Vanguard Award, teachers nationwide, they nominate students. And out of all the nominees, only 10 people are selected as finalists. And out of them 10 people, you got to write an essay and they look at your essay and they select seven winners that get awarded a, a nice award and the career I'm f pursuing is in architecture so that's all I wanted. <laughs> uh, any any questions? questions, comments? <laughs> oh. all right. Thank you very much. Um, I, personally, these are my favorite teachers. No offense to you guys, Miss Kelly. <laughs> these are the culinary teachers. Miss Macy is our leading teacher. <laughs> we have our para, Miss C, and our other para, Miss G. Uh, we have Mr. Kel Mr. Keo and Ms. Kelly, and we have our guidance counselor here. Uh, we made cupcakes, so you guys can enjoy. Thank you. Another nice round of applause, and again, it all starts uh, with our Mr. Fields, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so Ms. Brenda, we're going to need you back in here, and uh, Mr. Keo as well. And uh, again, these are non-fattening cupcakes, so I can have quite a few. But again, we want to thank uh, the students uh, for doing this. They've got a great program there. Uh, and uh, I've been actively involved with the Business Advisory Council for many, many years now. And uh, we were just at a, a wonderful luncheon just a few weeks ago where we had, uh, what, four or five different school districts presenting? Two more. Yep, and Burnox and us. And it was a great presentation uh, that they gave, and I was very, very impressed. So with this, if I may, Madam uh, President, if I may have the floor. You may. You have the floor. Thank you. And we have cupcakes, so they are fairly quiet, so you can peel the uh, cupcake Thank back. You. Nice job, by the way. So if I may, we have a, a resolution honoring uh, Brenda Parker. Whereas the non-traditional employment and training project, NET, is sponsored by the State University of New York and funded by the New York State Education Department through the Carl D. Perkins Grant. And whereas the NET Project sponsors the Vanguard Award, which recognizes outstanding secondary and post-secondary level students throughout New York State who are enrolled in a career and technical education programs that are non-traditional for their gender, with the same being presented annually to four secondary and two post-secondary students. I have to stop here. Please don't forget my desk. <laughs> They're not getting away with that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Whereas Mr. Keogh has stated that Brenda is one of my best students ever, added that he taught college-bound students at the main high school campus for seven years, and that Brenda is more driven than 90% of the students I've had. She's willing to put in the hard work. And whereupon Mr. Keogh's nomination, Brenda won the Vanguard Award for her dedication, wisdom, maturity, and insight. Now therefore be it resolved that the, Schenectady, the city of Schenectady pauses its deliberations to congratulate Ms. Brenda Parker on her achievement of winning as one of our only four students in New York State the Vanguard Award and wish you all the best in your future endeavor. Congratulations, Brenda. Okay, um, Ms. Mr. Kosher, I assume you moved it. Is there a second? Mr. Mutavaran, okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, make it official. Thank you. So much. Um, if I could just give advice to anybody, I would say try your best at everything you do, because that's what I do, and follow your dreams, because if you really want it to happen, they'll become a reality. Thank you all so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and congratulations again. I, th I think the only thing I would add is um, Whereas bad behavior is sometimes contagious, good behavior is also contagious. Brenda's bought, brought the level of all my classes up because of her drive and her ambition and her caring about her classes, and um, she's a model student. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Brenda's dad is here too. Ms. Parker, congratulations. Great daughter. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, again. Seconds? Yeah. Yeah, this is dinner for some of us. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> oh, my. What kind, what kind is this? Oh, I, I'm not going to be able to. All right. I'll take it. What the heck? Thank you. Oh, gosh, thank you. Fruit, so it's good for you. <laughs> Mr. Kozier, we should do this at least once a month. <laughs> okay. All right, we have our second out of order resolution, uh, which is a local law uh, with changing the name of Norwood Avenue to Mike Maeda Way. Mr. Riggy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to bring uh, Mary Ellen Tony Bonome up. For those of you who don't know, Mike Maeda was a coach of Schenectady Little League back in its heyday until the 90s. Mike brought three teams to, the, to Williamsport and actually won the Little League World Series in 1954. Mary Ellen, come on up. We have uh, Mike's daughter, his only child, Mary Ellen. So you can see Mike wasn't in it for reasons like some of us got in it, like I did, because we had sons playing or daughters playing, which didn't happen until the 70s. Mike was in it for the right reasons. Mike did so much for the youth of Schenectady, I can't say enough about this man. It, just what he contributed to kids of Schenectady. Mike Maeda and George Rose should have statues uh, erected in Schenectady because they really deserve it. Uh, and I can't say enough about that, but I'm going to read this resolution for your dad. Watch the cupcake. Huh. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, that's better. Whereas in 1949, Mike Maeda, because of this love of baseball and children, was one of the founders of Schenectady Little League. And whereas he was an excellent coach and mentor, which is shown by the 13 district titles, eight sectional titles, six state titles, and three regional titles, his teams won during the 50s and the 60s, which led to three trips to the Little League World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania culminating in 1954 when his team won the world championship for Schenectady, New York. And whereas he continued to coach well into the 1990s and later was inducted into the Schenectady City 
School District Athletic Hall of Fame. And whereas, as a coach, he stressed that baseball was about more than just winning and believed it taught young people fair play, good sportsmanship, and help them become better citizens of tomorrow. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on the 60th anniversary of the 1954 championship season, that portion of Norwood Avenue between Schuyler Street and Michigan Avenue shall be renamed Mike Mayetta Way to celebrate and honor a man who was not only a great coach but a great Schenectadian. Madam President, I move this resolution. All right, is there a second? Mr. Erickson, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Before I turn the mic over to uh, Mary Ellen, I've been thinking about this a bit, and in the 50s and 60s, Schenectady was really uh, a hotbed for athleticism. There was a lot of great athletes came out of the Capital District area. And I'm thinking, well, what was the difference? Schenectady did, I mean, all these, these uh, awards and, and the championships that they won, the sectionals, the states, all that. And the difference was Mike. There's no question about it. Mike was a great coach and a great teacher. I learned a lot from him, you know, in my coaching days, just, just being around Mike. He just was a wealth of knowledge, and he really cared about the children of Schenectady. So, Marianne, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm, I'm, I'm so touched about this. This is uh, uh, one of the biggest honors, I, I would say. And um, they'll see that sign and they'll, they'll remember my father. And it's a perfect where it is near Little League, my father's home away from home. And I just want to thank um, the city of Schenectady, Mayor Gary McCarthy, and the city council members. And a special thanks to you, Vince, for bringing, having the idea, thinking of the idea, and bring it to a proposal to where we are now. And I thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tony Bonome's father, just so you know, Lindy Bonome was also very, as a matter of fact, I wear the pin proudly. It's got Tony and Mike Maeda on it. And Mike gave me this pin. With, with both their names on it from 19, the 1954 season. And don't forget, on August 27th will be the unveiling of the name, and we're going to have a celebration on Norwood Avenue for this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have one public hearing tonight, and because we did not get printed information about this, I'm just going to ask Mr. Polster to briefly explain it. Provisions for the city of Schenectady with respect to parking meters uh, has a series of provisions that require, uh, for instance, uh, one parking meter for every two spots or parking spots, spaces. And the city is considering and wishes to start using the parking kiosks. Uh, those are, and I'm sure that everybody is familiar with them, there are many municipalities that have already started to use them, but that is one machine that services eight spaces, ten spaces, and if somebody wants to, they can go in, they can put cash in it, they can put their credit card in, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, the machine will then print a ticket that they can place on their uh, dashboard and uh, they can just say how much time they need and buy that specific amount of time. Uh, it's very convenient and less maintenance for the city. Uh, many of them and the ones that we are looking at are solar powered. Uh, so it's a, it's a very economical uh, way to go and it uses advanced technology to the benefit of both those people coming to the city and the city itself. Uh, and because the code sections that are in existence now uh, only contemplated the typical old style parking meter, the changes that are being proposed are those that would allow the kiosk uh, uh, to be used uh, at least within various locations within the city. Okay, thank you. I have two people signed up to speak. The first is Joe Kelleher. Good evening, City Council, Mr. Mayor, Madam President. My name is Joe Kelleher. I'm a resident of the city, and uh, I know I spoke on this several times last year regarding the parking meters, but uh, once again, I, I stress 
that getting these parking meters before their time is going to be more of a burden on the taxpayers. We don't want to take out more loans. I understand that monies have been set aside for this, but there's still over $3 million in unpaid parking violations that we can collect on this and pay for these outright without going into more debt. There's also plans, if I understand correctly, with this resolution on putting uh, kiosks on Upper Union Street where there's already great business up in that area. This would, uh, has a potential to create less business in that area because uh, park, people are going to try to find parking where there are no parking meters and, and walk. So, and people are going to be reluctant to do so. So I would, uh, we may want to look into a little bit more uh, public input on this as far as placement of the meters, where they're going to be placed, uh, these kiosks. I have been in other municipalities that use them. They're a great opportunity, but I believe that the public deserves and, uh, and needs to have more input on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next person is David Jackalone. Hello. I'm David Giacalone. I'm not running for anything. No. Today was very frustrating, um, not having anything to help me know what this public hearing was about. Uh, turned out to be a, a strange situation. Um, and so basically this public hearing is a predicate to what? It's hard to know because it wasn't about anything. Um, but I would have liked to have known, John just told us what the purpose was, but I would have liked to have seen the words. I would like to have seen if it said anything about the, what the actual distance can be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as an example of that, last year you spent, I don't know, six months, and you wrote one sentence. It has a typo, and it does not conjugate. It seems to say that the mayor may set the meters, which I guess means pour the concrete, but he's probably is going to try to designate that particular um, action. But. It's just sloppy, it's, it's, it's sloppiness, and I don't understand why there's such sloppiness. Um, if you're gonna look and say, are there parts of the parking meter ordinance that might be inconsistent with our kiosk plan, how about reading the whole thing? Because if you read the whole thing, you'd see that there's a section 248-72 that says you may not extend the period of time that past the original the maximum duration time by putting more money in a parking meter. It sounds to me that many of the things you've been saying about what's great about this will in fact allow people to go back and put in more and stay longer. So the issue of what is the duration going to be, how much turnover are you going to cause or lose are all things that need to be talked about. And they also need to be specified, you need standards and guides from the legislature, which is the only body given the power to set rates in the state, legis the state legislation. You need to let the mayor know what your policy is and what your standards are so that he can implement your standards and your policy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have no one else signed up to speak, so I'm going to call this public hearing closed. We will move on to approval of the minutes from April 28, 2014. Okay, Mr. Kozier moves it. Mr. Terrazzo seconds it. All in favor? Aye. And communications and petitions. Communications presented to the City Council for Monday, May 12, 2014. Under official from the mayor, a list of appointments dated May 12, 2014. Under general, there are none. Under petitions, there is one petition containing 51 signatures from Emmett Street residents protesting the opening of a convenience store at 865 Emmett Street. Okay. Thank you. Um, committee reports. Do we have any committee reports? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we'll move on to privilege of the floor related to the legislative agenda. I have six people signed up. Uh, the first is Jason Plank. 
Madam President, City Council, Mayor. Uh, last week when you were going over the community development block grants, some of the uh, comments were um, just uh, forgotten the history of what the community development block grants. One of them was dealing with MACTAB. Um, it's 40,000 going there. Um, some of you are saying, well, they're not meeting their goals or they're just barely meeting their goals. Uh, the major problem is, is that MACTAP is there to certify minority um, and women-owned and disabled participations within contracts that are given by the city and the county. And when you have one of the MACTAP board members is the affirmative action officer for, uh, for this program, uh, you got a big con giant conflict not only there, but also too is, is that when he's not even enforcing, we had Erie Boulevard. $14 million contract, $13 million of it was, was for federal funds. And minority and women-owned and uh, personal disability participation was zilt. Um, you know, you're trying to say they're not meeting their goals, but you turn around and it's a catch-22. The only way they can meet their goals is if Mary Kuczewski, the affirmative action, is enforcing the current laws and trying to get participation into effect. That was the whole purpose of MACTAP. It's there to be. MACTAP is not there to be certifying um, for minority participation. The person who has to do it is Mary Kajewski. Again, she keeps throwing that onto MACTAP. So, you know, I mean, there's so, I mean, and to cut their funds is not very good. And to cut it in half, um, you know, I was hoping that Councilman Allen, uh, former Councilman Allen would be here tonight or somebody from MACTAP. Um, the other piece is to give more money to SNAP. Well, four years ago, uh, you guys received $800,000. You turned around and played a ping pong between SNAP and code enforcement with that 800000 And you keep playing it back and forth without any accountability, without any goals or even accomplishments. And you keep throwing that money back and forth from each department so that way you can just spend it any way you want to. And that's the back of the house money. We haven't had a public hearing on staff money. And that's a whole, th whole thing. And then you're trying to tell people, hey, you've got to vote for the community development because you already uh, voted for it in the budget in October. You know, I mean, again, what is this, a $3.3 .3 million slush fund of community development block grant money uh, where the mayor staff can say, this is where I'm going to spend it. Uh, we don't care about public comment. We don't care about what the city council says. And that's the way it's been. And, you know, we've got a five-year consolidated plan that's going to be due next year. Where's the plan for that? Jobs were supposed to be also included in the 2010. Where was the job components? There has not even been any kind of a jobs component or put in any kind of direction. Hopefully you'll be able to reconsider and look at some of this stuff next year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Smith. If I may, the three uh, speakers for the Habitat would like to come up together. Okay. Mayor, Madam Chair, and City Council members, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. The Habitat for Humanity of Schenectady County, as you know, is, has been around for about 20 years. And over that time, we've completed 43 homes. That means we've placed 43 low to mid-income families into homes, and we've created 43 taxpayers for the, city of, uh, for the county. 41 of those were here in Schenectady County. Uh, we fully endorse the allocations that have been laid out in the Community Development Block Grant. And we'd like to, to point out that Habitat is more than just a group of people that build houses. In the process, we bring the community together. We bring in hundreds of volunteers. They spend thousands of hours building these homes. We're teamed with organizations such as Better Neighborhoods, and North, especially Northeast Parent and Child to help build the community by help build, building people who, or, or rather training people, who are willing to give their time and, and know, have the skills and know how to put houses together and bring people back into the city um, as, as responsible taxpaying citizens. We have... Uh, a wonderful relationship with the Northeast Parent and Child Youth Build, and we hope for that uh, relationship to continue. And we ask for your consent in approving the Community Development Block Grant. Thank you. Uh, my 
Uh, our building uh, site selection chair, Dan Smith, will now speak to the building, pro uh, rather to the proposal for houses on Cary Street. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Smith. I'm uh, the site selection chairman for Habitat for Schenectady. I'm also a member of the board of Habitat. The, block, uh, the money that we have requested this year, uh, it jointly with um, to the Youth Build Organization of Northeast Parent and Child, is to build two new houses where there currently are three derelict houses on um, Cary Street. We would require money to uh, demolish those houses and remediate the site. And as you're aware, that's a fairly expensive proposition because of all of the necessary lead and asbestos abatement with old houses in, in Schenectady. So those costs are included in that. And then from that, we would build two new houses on that site where there currently are, are three that have been consolidated into two proper sized uh, lots. We would build two single family homes and those would be uh, about 50% funded by the home funds. The rest of the funds for those would be funds from Habitat and from Northeast Parent and Child. And again, all of the labor would be essentially volunteer labor uh, except for the, that contracted labor and all of our contracted labor is almost always City of Schenectady labor. Uh, all of the purchases are bid out under uh, very careful uh, control of the bid process and go as uh, is often required to uh, local people. So the money stays in Schenectady. The costs are borne by 50% uh, by what we're asking for from uh, the, the home grant and 50% by our organizations putting up the other half of, the, of our costs. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> Madam Chairperson, and City Council members, I'd like to make three points. Let me speak to um, the enduring nature of our partnership with Habitat for Humanity. As you know, we recruit young men and women, 18 to 24, uh, mostly from the Hamilton Hill Vale neighborhood. It requires a special kind of organization that can work with those individuals. Not just any construction company and not just any community organization, but Habitat for Humanity is the organization. How do I know? Because they've been working with us for the past five years or more on a number of projects. They also share our vision of employability, which in turn generates tax revenue for the city. Uh, home ownership for those of modest income on an affordable housing project. You need more homeowners that remain committed to their properties in the city of Schenectady. And remo removal of urban blight, consequently the demolition of the three blighted properties and the preparation for land use. This is a key, key and critical component of our U.S. federal DOL grant. In fact, I can tell you, the U.S. Department of Labor has selected us previously because we've had meaningful construction projects with Habitat for Humanity. How do we work together? Well, Habitat oversees the project. They supply, meaning the funds, uh, with good fiduciary behavior. Uh, they supply their own supervision and their volunteers. Northeast funds, out of other monies available to us, are construction managers. We pay stipends for the youth build students. I mean, they've got to be able to get there and eat lunch. And we also are going to provide some support for materials through a three-year a donation we have with one of the largest producers of environmental materials in the world, the San Gobain Corporation, 
For those of you who may remember uh, Norton's in Green Island, uh, they acquired Norton's. Uh, uh, what are the outcomes? And outcomes that Habitat can lay claim to as well as we. Uh, we've done over, uh, let's see, 72 youth a year for uh, multiple years. There's quite a few youth. We, we have achieved uh, an 82% GED passing rate in six to nine months. Now, they couldn't pass that test if they couldn't relate math and science to construction work in the field. Better, we've achieved an 84% employability rate. How was that done? Because the skills that they acquire working with Habitat, using a national construction curriculum, achieving OSHA training certification, and a national certification are what prepare them, not only for construction trades, but to enter energy efficiency, advanced manufacturing, and go to college, both at Schenectady Community College, which I always encourage them to do. I wish I'd gone there. <laughs> and on. This is a great organization. We're not looking for just construction activities. Our students won't learn by fixing shutters and painting porches. We need the, the, uh, the complete and comprehensive work that comes with a new construction project. The partnership is critical to the success of our Youth Build grant and it fulfills the objectives jointly held and visioned by the city in support of its strategic plan, mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity and Northeast Parent and Child Society. I thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Joe Kelleher. Thank you once again. Uh, regarding item number three, <clears throat> with the adopted, uh, adopting the consolidated plan, uh, one of the things I touched on last week, uh, or rather two weeks ago, was on the uh, half mile of road uh, that was planned on being repaved to the tune of four hundred twenty-six thousand uh, dollars. I misspoke last uh, the, the last meeting where I said a square foot of road would cost $125 per square foot. It's actually $1.25 per square foot, and that's for milling and paving both. Now, taking a look at that alone, uh, 30 feet wide of the road by uh, 5,280 uh, 5, feet long only comes up to $198,000. Half a mile would be under $100,000. So in other municipalities where, where this would only cost that much, my question is, why is it quadrupled here in the city of Schenectady? Uh, if we were just going to pave that, you can cut that number in half, that $100,000, and only pay for about $52,000 for a half mile of road. So uh, I'm a little concerned uh, that if we're only paying, if we're paying this much for that much road, how much other waste is inside this consolidated plan that we can look to and restructure and rebuild and dig into deeper? And I think that this, that this consolidated plan is being jumped on too quickly without us looking deep, deep enough as a city. Uh, regarding the uh, resolution for the, uh, uh, the Metroplex uh, Authority and the IDA to the Eastern Avenue properties, uh, in taking a look at some of these properties, we still have properties that are owned uh, under the IDA's name that are, are, were purchased by uh, private entities, such as the old DSS building that was purchased by this private entity for $1 and still is not on the tax rolls because it's still being held under the IDA's name. That's another part where we have some very wasteful spending we could be getting, receiving revenue on. Uh, regarding the number 12, the resolution on the New York State Abandoned Property Relief Tax, I had to dig through a rabbit hole to take a look through this. Uh, and I found the, the resolution, 
but uh, at the bottom of the resolution, it's just blank saying here it is resolved. There's no detail on it. I kept digging for detail and finally found a little bit of information up on the state's website. But this is yet again, uh, for me, being a computer engineer and understanding how the web works and finding, uh, trying to find this information, people that are not as savvy on the computer would have a very difficult time finding this information. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Wicks. Because I want to start out by uh, you know, appreciating Marion Porterfield and Vincent Greggy for the work they're doing in the parks here as volunteers, uh, getting it ready for the children this summer. And, uh, but uh, my, my original purpose to be here was uh, I'm concerned about this vendetta over those small stores. And, you know, it's a part of the heritage of the United States. Abraham Lincoln started, came off the farm and went to work in a small store and. Uh, Salem, Illinois, that's where I you know, learned, where I studied, and I you know, learn, learn, learned political skills. Or Muriel, Go Muriel Cuomo, the father of existing governor, was you know, born over above the family store down in Queens in 1931 and worked in the store. That's where I studied and probably Ms. developed the skills. Excuse me, Mr. Wicks, this is privilege of the floor regarding the legislative agenda, not general city business. Oh, it's, okay, it's, I thought this was the uh, no, general okay. comment area. I'll, I'll call on you when we get oh, to okay, that I'm section sorry. then. Thank you, I'm sorry. All right, so I have no one else signed up to speak to the legislative agenda, so we clear that portion closed, and we will move to approval of the legislative agenda. Okay, Mr. Kozier moves it. Okay, Ms. Perazzo seconds. All in favor? Aye. And then we have the one item, which is the roll call vote. And the clerk would read that. Okay. Item number three, a resolution adopting the 2014-2015 consolidated plan. All right, so discussion, Mr. Riggi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, oh, oh, Mr. Riggi, hold on. I'm just reminded we need a motion first to move this to the agenda. So, okay, Ms. Porterfield, second. Mr. Kosher, all in favor? Aye. Okay, that's yours. Now, on this consolidated plan, I have some issues with it, and it goes back to uh, the majority of the city council meeting without me present or the public present to discuss the nuts and bolts of what was presented last Monday night. I thought that stuff was over with, but apparently it isn't. It's in violation of open meetings laws. And you can call it what you want. You can call it a caucus, call it what you want. You're discussing city business. You're not discussing political strategy. So I have a real problem with that. I want to know how, how people come to their conclusions of how they feel about things and when they come with these proposals, and we don't know that. The other thing that's come to my attention is there could be some at least an air of conflicts of interest in some of these uh, proposals, who sits on the boards, whose department may benefit from this. I would like to have, at least before we vote, have the council members that may be affected by this at least disclose if they're involved on a board or what, what not from somebody who may be uh, getting some of the CDBG money tonight if it, if it does pass. But the process, in my estimation, has been flawed, and it's flawed because you're meeting to discuss things like this out of the purview of the public, and that is not right. It's illegal is what it is. So I will not be voting yes on this for sure, but uh, we'll see how the other council people feel about this. Thank you. All right. Anyone else comment? Mr. Erickson? Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, when we talked about this in committee, you know, I have an opinion on lots of things as we go through the budget. And, um, you know, one of my concerns with the um, specific item, and there was three gentlemen that came up today to speak regarding the habitat funding. And, and my opinion was that habitat funding should go to uh, the land bank. And so, uh, as government should function, people are allowed to have different opinions. And the way the vote falls, the way the vote falls, and I understand that. I don't always win the vote, it's just an opinion, and, and uh, the public really should have the majority rule. Uh, what I uh, found to be more frustrating than just not having 
enough people agree with me on the issue, uh, was more the method of uh, how I was being talked out of it. And I think that um, you know, one of the things that were brought up in committee is they said, Carl, you can't do that because they're not a 501c3 organization. And I said, oh, okay, well, I guess that rules it out. And then I said, well, is that a federal regulation? No, it's a policy. Is that a federal policy? No, it's a city policy. And so as I asked two and three and four more questions, it's actually our own policy that prevents us from doing this. And so to say that we can't, is not necessarily accurate. It's more of a, well, you, somebody in the city, you know, many, many moons ago set a policy, and I don't, at this point, I don't even know if it's a written policy. It's more like an urban legend policy uh, that says we can't do it that way. And so after my comments on Monday, I understand that there were, you know, quite a few meetings called at City Hall, and uh, in came Habitat, and in came uh, the chairman of the land bank, and lots of discussions were conducted, and, uh, the, I guess the director of the, of the Habitat has been removed for reasons apparently similar to what my concerns were uh, regarding uh, overspending on budgets. So I said, okay, let's, you know, I guess underlines my concern uh, that we were going to get more value out of spending the money a different way. Um, then we get a letter from the land bank saying, hey, the land bank's not interested in the money. Now, I've talked to different members of the land bank uh, committee, uh, the, the board, and they want money. They're saying, we're going to the state for money, we're looking for funding anywhere we can get it, and then all of a sudden they say, hey, here's an idea, we could fund this organization, I believe in the charter of the land bank as a, as a council, the people who were on the council at the time made a resolution saying, we support the land bank, please approve this legislation at the state level. Uh, there was demand for it, and so I felt we should fund it, because we believed in the charter of, of the land bank. And so now we get this one member of the, the land bank says, no, we don't want it, which was a surprise because as I talked to the other members of the land bank, they said, well, we didn't know that letter was going out. And so it seems like there's a tremendous political pressure to, to block this idea I had. I wasn't saying, you know, grabbing everyone by the neck and saying, you have to do it my way. I was just saying, hey, I got an idea. It's something to consider. And I would have been happy if I just was the only one voting one way and everyone else voted the other way. Uh, so it was disheartening to see the method in which I was talked out of it. So um, I have nothing against Habitat for Humanity. I think that it was a lot of money to spend for two houses, and I felt that we could spend it wiser in a different method, and that's really the basis of my concerns. So um, thank you for allowing me to express my, my opinions, and I guess we'll have a vote soon. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Kozier. Thank you. Oh, Mike, here we go. Uh, First of all, my concerns with Habitat for Humanity. Um, Mr. Erickson, all due respect to yourself, uh, we can't stand up here publicly and make an accusation about an executive director being released for overspending of a budget when that, in fact, we do not know that that's true or not. Uh, I'm sure I've got the floor. Hold on, I've got the floor, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I still have the floor, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Kozier has the floor. I have the floor, Mr. Erickson. You can, you can rebut. We could rewind the tape if we want, but that's kind of the gist that I got, that the, the, it was made. Okay, thank you. I do appreciate that because Habitat for Humanity is, is a tremendous organization. And again, their partnership with Northeast Parent and Child, I think, is second to none. Uh, what these folks do as partners, I think that is part of our goal in the comprehensive plan. It's very, very important that we have agencies working together, especially when funding is very, very tight out there. The work that Youth Build does is, again, just incredible. Uh, these youth that they uh, work with, again, mostly inner city youth, all walks of life, both ethnicities, all over the place. But the most important thing is most of these kids don't have their GEDs. They're working, they've dropped out of high school, they're working for their GEDs, they work right on Franklin Street there in the old Social Security Administration building. Northeast offers them a stipend. And then these youth, I call them youth, they're, they're kids for the most part, actually go out into the field, into the construction fields. And we just uh, honored uh, Brenda Parker today, who uh, had a non-traditional um, occupation for herself. We have men and women, both sides, doing carpentry, plumbing, electrician, and the work that they do on these jobs is incredible. 
Uh, we're looking to partner with the Steinmetz Career Center, who was here uh, earlier. There's another grant uh, that YouthBuild received for a weatherization program. And we're looking to get the YouthBuild students involved with our students in Schenectady High School and at the Steinmetz Career Center to work and engage them in that building in, in a career uh, field, which I think is very, very important. We talked about the funding, uh, two for one, and, and the cost, the extreme cost uh, that we thought was in here. But if you, again, look at the projects, break them out, you will see that this is a very worthwhile program, a very worthwhile organization. And again, the partnerships, I think, are very important that we have here. Uh, in regards to Mr. Riggy, um, with the caucus, whatever you want to call ourselves, meeting, um, you had plenty of opportunities last Monday during a committee meeting to state any reservation or any comments you had concerning the CDBG fund. In fact, I recall at least three different occasions we had asked you specifically, do you have anything to add? You sat there, you said nothing, or you said no. That was the opportunity we had in public meeting to discuss what we wanted to do. That was the opportunity where we all should have been meeting on the same topic. In regards to individuals who are sitting on boards, um, organizations, certainly I, I'm addressing your comment, I'm sure it was towards me. The Scotty County Youth Bureau is one of the applicants uh, on the CDBG um, applications. Uh, when I submitted it in uh, January of 28th of this year, I was not yet on the city council. My name was the applicant on the application. And since then, uh, Dennis Packard, uh, who is the Commissioner of Social Services, who I report directly to, is now the applicant uh, on the application. This is not the first year we've received funding. This is, in fact, the fourth year. Uh, but again, the partnership is with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Schenectady and Schenectady Job Training Agency. The Youth Bureau does not get a single penny from that grant or from the, from the CDBG funds to the Youth Bureau at all. It doesn't fund my salary doesn't go into programs, does not go into supplies to Youth Bureau. We receive zero. We're simply a pass-through for those two organizations. And again, the programs that we have put out at both Hillhurst and Steinmetz Park, where the grant is for, again, has just changed both of those neighborhoods. Um, Mr. Riggie can attest to the problems we used to have in Bellevue at the Hillhurst Pool for many, many years. Uh, we used to get, it was as bad as Quackenbush for a long time, where we used to have calls almost on a daily basis uh, for unruly uh, youth in the pool, not adhering to the rules and the guidelines. We came in with the Boys and Girls Clubs, partnered with the Sheriff's Department with the uh, Safe Child ID cards. Now every student has a code of conduct that they have to sign off on with their parent and guardian, and they also have a photo ID in order to use the facilities. It has been tremendous. We've walked around Bellevue, and all the residents there say it's just been a tremendous, tremendous asset and very, very good uh, programming and funding. And again, Steinmetz, we look forward this year with the new pavilion in place. Uh, to continue to serve the needs and concerns in the north end of the city, which, believe it or not, in the summer, there really are no rec programs up there. The Boys and Girls Club uh, is closed for the summer. They have their Camp Lovejoy. So this summer is going to be a very, very important program for us to have at Steinmetz Park, and uh, we look forward to that partnership as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Perazzo. Yes, just uh, one point of clarification regarding the paving. We discussed in committee uh, very publicly that that half mile was the cost of that half mile was being taken out and putting back in the general paving budget and now will be uh, used for recycling and re hot asphalt recycling and others. So just qualification that uh, we wanted to get the best bang for our buck also. As far as city policy goes, I have no problem looking at city policy, but not in the 11th hour before we make a vote. I think that has to be a very strategic an in-depth conversation. Also, last year during this process, another council member did suggest that we reallocate funds to an entity that did not apply for CDBG funding. And Ms. Porterfield felt very, very strongly that following that process is key. We have a process, people apply, we fund applications that are completed in full. Uh, we even had an application this year that many of us wanted to support, but the application actually rated low. So as a council, even though I think a lot of us felt like we really wanted to go forward with reallocating some of the funds to them, uh, we, we aborted that process because of a, a weak application. So I think the process is key, and I agree 100% with Ms. Porterfield. I don't disagree with funding the land bank. I fully support the, the land bank, but the land bank didn't apply. Um, and it's not a 501c3, which right now is our city policy. We may, as a council, want to take a look at that and change that city policy. 
I'm happy to be part of that conversation. I do not sit on any boards that have applied for CDBG funding, so we'll get that right out of the way. And then on to the habitat issue. Um, it's m to my knowledge that Habitat put out a statement to all of us saying that they wanted to keep uh, Mr. Clark's um, <laughs> dismissal uh, quiet, you know, private to them, and that's certainly their right to do. And I think that unless the Habitat for Humanity board wants to make a statement as to whether, why Mr. Clark was let go, um, I don't think any of us should be making that statement in public. Um, I think we need to respect the public statement that's already been made by Habitat. I know that if I were released from my job, I wouldn't want you know, there to be <laughs> um, assumptions in, in that. So, um, and just back to Habitat and Youth Build. Youth Build is a very important program to me. They have extremely strong outcomes. So does Habitat for Humanity. They have a good track record. And most importantly, the city monitors outcomes, which is part of the reason why we chose to encourage MCTAP to meet higher, set and meet higher bars um, by decreasing their funding. That was kind of our message to McTapp to say, okay, it's time to really step up to the plate. It's time to go forward in good faith and create some, some fundraising on your own, raise your bar a little bit higher, let's make this program more robust. It's not that we don't believe in it, it's just been a little bit stagnant. So let's take it to the next level. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Porterfield? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me state that I uh, sit on the Hamilton Hill Arts Board, and um, I, when all this discussion came about, I did contact an attorney that's not connected with the city to find out, um, based on our code of ethics, if there was a conflict. I am not paid for my position there, and I don't get to decide what funding is asked for or any of those things, so I just needed to state that I am a board member, just a regular board member. Um, in, in terms of the CDBG process, we you know, we're having a lot of discussion about it now. And um, in my recollection, this is the first year where there's been so much discussion around the CDBG process. I'm not saying it's a perfect process. I, I, don't, I don't think that anything is perfect. And is there room to, um, for some improvement? Is there things maybe we should look at? I, I think absolutely we should. Um, as Ms. Perrazzo has stated, last year there was a group that they wanted to fund and I adamantly said no, if they, you know, if the process is that everyone must submit an application, then for, in my mind that applies to everyone. Otherwise that means that if someone that I think should be funded and I have enough pull, then I can get that to happen. So I don't think that's fair to the people that are applying when they're always told there's a process and then we get into the process and say, well, let's make this exception. Um, I wouldn't want to be the, on the receiving end of that, and I certainly then would not be on the giving end of that. Um, so, you know, I, I, we've had a lot of discussion regarding the CDBG process, and I believe that going forward we should discuss it more and about how it should, maybe it could, it could be different, it could change if, if have, being a 501c3 is absolutely necessary. I mean, this has brought up a lot of discussion, and I think before the next process happens, we should discuss these things and make sure that um, everyone's comfortable with them. Um, there's been a lot of conversation regarding our public hearing and how we handle that on the CDBG process. And I think we should take a look at that because the public is coming to us and saying, well, you know, I don't think the process is, you know, you should get changed how you do that. And there should be more public input. So when we go into this next year, if we could get the information a lot further out, we would have the time to discuss that, to have public hearings in a time frame where the public can actually come and give their input because ultimately these dollars come to the city based on certain demographics so they have to be spent a certain way and, and so I think that that needs to be explained a little bit better because sometimes people uh, feel that money can be moved any place but that, that, that cannot happen. We, we say this is what we're going to do with the money based on these demographic, these, these statistics and therefore we must spend it like that, not get it based on that and then spend it someplace else. So um, all of that needs to be explained and I, again I'll say we should look at the process um, more closely and work with the Department of Development um, so that everyone understands and most especially the public understands what we're doing with the CDBG dollars. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Erickson. 
Thank you, Madam, for the second opportunity. Um, regarding to um, what Mr. Kozier was speaking with um, the, the director, you know, leaving, the reason why I mentioned it, I was received a phone call from a board member saying that's what happened, and then it was a situation that was made public. So I did not know it was a secret. I think it was a relatively public uh, comment, and of somebody who's gone through a similar situation where uh, losing employment being made public, I, I could sympathize more than anybody else here, I believe. So, um, the, uh, again, you know, it was an idea. I might feel that one of my main jobs here is if I have an idea of what we can do to make this place a better place to live, uh, I'm going to open my mouth and talk about it. Uh, I just feel that it was guns a blazing when Carl has an idea, you know, in terms of opposition. All we needed is just a vote, and people said, now we don't agree with you, and it would have been fine. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mutavaran. Thank you, Madam President. I did have an opportunity to go over many of these applications, and like Ms. Porterfield, um, I think we need more time to go over this application, and, and we're talking about cutting funds from one organization or a few. I think they're, based on my observation on these applications, I think funds should have get cut from a lot of organization based on poor outcome. And we have funds, I can go through many of them here, that we have duplication of services and we have entities and organization that's, you know, doing the same thing over and over. We need to look at this application next year carefully and maybe come up with ideas how we can revamp this, um, the guidelines and award, how we award um, CDBG next year. And, you know, we have funds there that I'm um, very concerned about one fund line, item number 60, $56,000, which we are not going to use. I've asked that we allocate that to a project, and, you know, I'm surprised that we have that floating around like that. And overall, I'm, I'm not happy with the awards. We need to look at it very carefully and, you know, encourage our organization to consolidate and, and do a better job out there. Thank you. Thank you. And I, for one, do not serve on any boards that are being funded by CDBG, so I think we're okay there. All right, if there's no more discussion, if the clerk would call the roll. Ms. Barrazzo? Aye. Ms. Porterfield? Aye. Mr. Erickson? No. Mr. Kozier? Yes. Mr. Riggy? Yes, again, I'm going to state when I stated earlier, Mr. Kozier trying to justify that I had a chance to talk. I want to talk with the rest of the council that I was elected to do, just like all of you here, except you, Mr. Kozier. So you were part of this. You're part of an illegal meeting. It's as simple as that. The meeting was illegal that you had to discuss this, and I won't be part of that. That's for sure. Let's do things open in the public like it should be. This is a public, this, this is what the public is for. This, this is what it's about, and it's a public forum. But say I had plenty of chances to talk, but I didn't say anything. Well, tell me how you would feel if this was the case. I don't come to the table when the meal's half over with. It's just baloney is what it is. And they hear this political hack nonsense. It just incites me is what it does. I vote no. Ms. King? Mr. Mudavaran. I'm sorry, Mr. Mudavaran. No. Ms. King? Aye. Re resolution is carried four to three. Okay. All right, we'll now move to privilege of the floor regarding uh, city business. Oh, oh, wait. Okay. Got item number 12, the uh, abandoned property act. Oh, okay. All right, we have a roll call also on item number 12. Sorry, I missed that. The clerk would read that. Somebody move up. A resolution in support of the New York State Abandoned Property Relief Act of 2014. All right, would someone move that? Okay, Ms. Perrazzo seconded by Mr. Kozier. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, discussion? Ms. Porterfield? Thank you. Um, Regarding this, we, we had some discussion at, about it at the committee meeting because of the legislation that was before us was a little bit different than the explanation that we were getting. And Ms. King, you did ask me if I'd heard, gotten the email from here, but I have to tell you that I, I was able to get the information from a different source regarding what the um, 
what the resolution was about so that I was able to find that out. But I just wanted to be clear in my answer that it, it didn't um, come through City Hall. Um, I had, and if I got that, I haven't read it, hadn't read it yet. Um, because at the last time I checked my email, it was not there, and I had asked for that. Um, but regarding that, I, I did have an opportunity to, re to read it. And I just ask that, um, you know, that we have the inf resolution information so that a, a council member or anyone else for that matter has to actually seek it out and figure it out. Um, so, you know, it, we're here and, and I did get it and so therefore I was able to read it and familiarize myself. But my preference would be that the information would be there when we have it in committee in order to, to do that work so that we're not at the, the day before or, um, you know, trying to figure it out and getting the information. So that is my, my, my comment and that I would certainly appreciate that. All right, Mr. Erickson. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah Ms. Porterfield has spoken as well. Um, the, you know, the state legislature considers thousands of pieces of legislation every year. Um, in the first I knew that the city was considering, you know, uh, supporting this was last Monday when we talked about it in committee. Um, and so I said, well, I'm not aware of it, so can I please get some information? And uh, as of yesterday, last time I checked my city email, uh, evening I did not receive it. So um, not that I don't support it. I guess I just don't know enough about it. Um, Property Relief Act sounds like a great idea, but there's language impacting banks and financing and things, so I think it's a bigger issue than uh, that I can just kind of uh, guess that I like it. So, um, not that I'm against it, but if it's appropriate to do so, I'd abstain. Is that, am I allowed to abstain for reason of not getting information in time for the meeting? I, is it appropriate to do so? Okay. Okay, anyone else? All right, if the clerk would call the roll. Okay, Ms. Perazzo. Aye. Ms. Porterfield? Yes. Mr. Erickson? Mr. Kozier? Yes. Mr. Riggi? Yes. Mr. Mutabaran? Yes. Motion is carried. Aye. I'm Ms. King. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we will move to a privilege of the floor regarding city business, and let me start with Frank Wicks. I apologize for speaking out turn earlier. I, my name was called, but I must have signed the wrong sheet. So uh, again, on uh, general stores, uh, uh, the, uh, I, I really think the vendetta against them is a bad thing. And I'm very disturbed over this story in the newspaper, sweep nuts violations by stores. It shows seven city officials and the only one store kind of pushed aside. Uh, now, it turns out that, as far as I can tell, there was no serious violation, but that, that wasn't the point anyway. The, I think the mayor admitted that he didn't care so much about violations. He just wanted a tool, so a, a tool for Harrison, small store members. Now, we have Mr. Fabio here, and he's been working that store for 25 years, serving the community. He works 12, 14 hours a day. His daughter's in there with him. Uh, uh, and. Uh, this picture with these authorities on the outside makes them look like a bad, makes the store look bad. It makes them look like a bad person. It makes it look like there's bad things going on inside the store. You know, I, I, I know Mr. Fabio, I know nothing would be true, further from the truth. He's really a solid citizen, hard working. And uh, as far as I know, I, I, don't, I don't know the other stores that well, but uh, I, I, I find this very offensive. I think the uh, I think the mayor ought to be apologizing to Mr. Fabio for orchestrating this kind of street theater. And I, I just, I, I did see this kind of street theater work with the uh, Albany Muslims, where, you know, frames serving time for, you know, good, solid, hardworking citizens. And, and by, uh, by, by this kind of, a, you know, slander with, uh, you know, authorities and big lineups, they look bad and, you know, machine guns on the roof during the trial and so on, that are no threat. You know, this, you know it's, it's the kind of theater to, that's used to slander innocent people, so I really think Mr. Uh, Fabio de deserves an apology. Okay, thank you. Marva Isaacs. Uh, 
Madam President, Mr. Mayor, City Council. I'm here tonight. I, on Saturday, I went to um, a training down at SUNY that the governor had there, um, citizen pre-preparation. And I know they had one at the college, but I think that the people in Schenectady didn't know anything about it. And we need to advertise this more when things like this is happening. It's not only for the rich and the famous, it's for everybody. Schenectady is a place that have lots of fires. We, they have flooding down and the stock here down there. And we need this training for everybody. And I think we should have another training in Schenectady that everybody will be able to go to it. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Rodriguez. Good evening, everyone. Here I am again, Moist District. And we also want to say that uh, we did get some uh, information that uh, about the traffic signal being corrected on Brandywine and Albany Street. So we want to thank you on that. And I also found out that there's a possibility that Moist Street will be done this year. I hope so. I also want to say that I really honor you, Mayor McCarthy. I really think you're a great mayor. You're a very great executive. You take care of business. I'm not trying to kiss your butt, and I'm just saying that. And um, the casino factor, I remember when it opened up in uh, Atlantic City back in 1992 or three, and after 20 years of myself going to Atlantic City back and forth, you know, because I traveled down south, I seen how sick the tore up the city was in the beginning, and if you took a ride there now, there's a big difference. I think Schenectady, if the council agrees, and the city does get the opportunity to receive a casino, I know there's their up and downs and their flaws or whatever, but I think the job growth and the improvement of the city will really grow like Atlantic City did. I mean, if you really seen Atlantic City back in 1993 and 94 when they opened up, compared to today, it is beautiful. And I think Schenectady has that opportunity. It really does. So I hope you guys vote in good conscience for the casino. Or maybe I'm talking out of turn, man. I don't know, because I am sick. So thank you, and we want to thank you. She Can I here. just say? Even though I wasn't able to get a happy Mother's Day for my son last day, yesterday, I really want to thank each and every one of you that has agreed to put up those lights, because now I really can be at peace. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Plank. Madam President, City Council, Mayor. Um, one of the things this is um, going in for um, road work and so forth, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it'll be the 24th anniversary this coming July, um, you're mandated to come up with a plan of how to put curb cuts in and how to make uh, sidewalks and so forth. And remember that, that the Community Development Block Grants, uh, you're funding for uh, the Quackabush Pool area. The Hamilton Hill area, people can't even get across Hewlett Street and Crane Street because the curb cuts are not there. Um, so, I mean, you're creating, uh, and when you're doing uh, resurfacing, you're um, cutting back on making sure that sidewalks and uh, curb cuts are putting in for quality of life. So you need to make sure that, uh, yeah, it's trying to save you some money, but you also need to start still working on, and you can, can be sued under the Title II for failing to do so. Um, the next thing um, is don't forget that assessments to grieve your assessments, check with um, the claims department, uh, Woodlawn, Hamilton Hills, Sam uh, Central State Street, and the downtown area are the ones that have been hit heavily with the developers and contractors of nearly in between 25 to 50 percent of their assessments have been reduced. So there's no need uh, or reasons that, that you should not be able to get your uh, assessments reduced down. Um, also, some of the city council members had, had asked me some other groups, uh, disability groups that are in the capital district uh, area or in the city of Schenectady. We have one that's uh, it's called the Schenectady ARC Self Advocates. They meet on the first Wednesday. Madam President, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to reach out to them. 
possibly invite him in October. Uh, October is Disability uh, Employment Awareness Month, and possibly they may be able to um, bring in a little bit about um, disability advocacy, like you do your uh, monthly meetings here. Um, that's a possibility. Um, I have some flyers from Schenectady ERC um, to hand out to you, and hopefully um, that'll help you. Um, I'll be checking with South Advocates. Um, they're off of Balltown Road, and I will get a hold of their flyers and so forth when I can get to them. Um, hopefully that'll help you out. And again, um, the Community Development Block Grants, we have got to, in September, to be able to hold some public hearings um, and to be able to take a look at some of the money in the background. Thank you. Thank you. Barat Arjun. Mr. Mayor, Madam President, thank you for the opportunity, City Council Member. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight on a very important topic. Could you, I have this for your I guess everybody here who knows who I am. If you don't, you will know who I am. <laughs> I live on Emmett Street for the past eight years. I've built a new house there, and I plan to stay there. The residents in the vicinity of 865 Emmett Street where the proposal for a deli slash convenience store is in the works is of concern that this store will materialize into a regular convenience store. I was told it is. Uh, the, the licensing is for a convenience store. This store will materialize, okay. Uh, with alcohol and tobacco products exposing our children to buying and using these products. Having a deli, convenience store in residential neighborhood decreases quality of life. We talk about promoting home ownership. This is not encouraging people to buy property and live in these neighborhoods when you continue to approve these types of businesses. Homeowners are contemplating leaving Emmett Street area. They are talking to me. I am talking to them. As you can notice, you can drive down Emmett Street now without being accosted by a drug dealer most of the times. Uh, we know the problems having Delhi in residential neighborhood result in thousands of police calls and man hours, and yet we seem to give more licenses. We had bad experiences from the old Delhi that burned down. I'm sure almost everybody here should know about that. Directly opposite this proposed convenience store, do you care about our community in the Hamilton Hill area? more or less. That's where I live. I'm very concerned. We are asking to pull the permits and any certificate of business use that is pending. All residents were not notified about this zone change. It's our understanding that such requirement comes with notifying the residents first before such undertaking. Why wasn't the resident notified this Delhi being placed into a developing neighborhood with so many occupied homeowners with children? These children would be subject to these types of behaviors and fall victim to the many Delhi convenience store illegal activities. We should not expose our children to these nuisances. Bear in mind, we also have a school one block away, and that's a fact. Allowing this would encourage loitering, drug using, littering, vagrant, and overall decreasing our quality of life. We ask that you reconsider licensing this deli. We don't need any more convenience store in Schenectady. Thank you. I am not finished. I have one more thing. We request a copy of the business application, if this is going, going to go ahead, if possible. The status of among the employees to operate the same. Uh, I spoke to uh, Mr. Steven Streichman's uh, associate two weeks ago. He indicated to me that the application was a variance of only a deli. And if he's here, I can accost him face to face. He told me that. Okay. There was a variance for only a deli. It, and I have a piece of paper here that says it's a convenience okay. store. I need you to summarize. Your time is up. OK, we don't need another convenience store. Indicated on the site plan approval to be heard on May 21st by the Planning Commission. We strongly request that you deny it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Joe Kelleher.
Thank you, and good evening once again. Uh, in taking a look at the, uh, the appointments, I noticed that we now have an appointment for a deputy assessor to the tune of $50,000 per year. Uh, there's been no information that I've been able to find as to the credentials for this, uh, this individual. Uh, I am aware that uh, the current uh, person who is acting in the position of the assessor uh, is who was only supposed to be there for three months is now just finally eight months later uh, in the process of uh, some type of an exit and uh, is training this new person but uh, it's my understanding we still don't have any information and there's a lot of controversy on this last year it'd be interesting to find out more information on this individual after all our tax, tax dollars are going toward uh, this person's uh, salary and we want to make sure that they're properly qualified as to the, uh, the uh, Affirmative Action Advisory Board, uh, there's been a lot of controversy over this. Um, I, I would just uh, really, really uh, uh, emphasize that diversity truly be maintained, uh, that we do have the right people for the job going into this position, and that city residents take precedent. After all, it is our city that we're talking about for this advisory board. Um, lastly, I, I, I want to stress uh, something very, that's very uh, important, and, and um, I'm not up here as a, as a city council candidate. Uh, I'm up here as a resident. I'm up here as a constituent. My tax dollars, just along with everybody else's, are going toward a lot of these programs that are being funded. The public funds and the tax dollars are being misused, and the public has a right to know where all this information is going. They have that these, there should be much more open government, there should be much more transparency, which is what many of the city council is, is discussing and boasting about, but we see a lot of things happening behind closed doors and don't find out about them until much afterward when decisions are already made. Uh, it's re out of respect to your constituents, out of respect to the city residents and the businesses that bring the money into the city. Um, and I encourage people to ask questions and be informed. Lastly, and of utmost important, uh, a special thank you to our veterans who are celebrating and made this country what it is and give us the right and the opportunity to ask the questions for our liberties and our freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. David Giacalone. Thank you again. I want to thank every single member of this council who has not yet been pushed or rushed into declaring, um, <laughs> declaring support for the covert casino. Right now, the only thing you're hearing is from interested parties, from the professional ch development cheerleaders who have never seen a big project that they've said no about, and from businessmen who would like to partner with the casino and have their services grow. An urban casino is an extremely different animal than a resort casino. And in 1996, the New York State Gaming Task Force did a major report to the, to the governor after doing enormous amount of research and surveys, etc. And they were for having casinos in upstate New York, but they warned that standalone casino will only have a market area of about 150 miles and will have very few overnight stays. And that, 20, that most of the people at the casino will come from within 25 miles of the casino and that means they are part of the local leisure market in competition with everybody else in the local leisure market. The report also said and warned of potential crime problems and they said, quote, including prostitution, panhandling, pickpocketing, and purse snatching. They also said that economic crimes would increase by pathological gamblers and vehicle-related crime like DUI and automobile break-ins are also on the list of crimes that, will, well, that may increase. I believe that you need to think about these things before thinking that a casino is going to be good. Schenectady is not desperate enough to, to stake its future on a casino. 
It's not Atlantic City by a long shot, and if you look behind those few blocks of buildings, Atlantic City is not doing so well. Um, I especially would like to point out that the stockade is nearby where the casino will be. The stockade has special protections under our law for it to preserve its residential qualities. That list of crimes that I just said to you are not going to help the residential quality of life of the people of the stockade. And there will also, of course, be a lot of drive, more, more drive-throughs um, and people who've been drinking all day. You should remember that despite what the so-called community leaders have said, 55.6% of the voters of District True, which is only the stockade and East Front Street, said no on the casino proposal last November. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have no one else signed up, so I'll declare this portion of the meeting closed. We'll move to miscellaneous business of the council. Ms. Perazzo. Thank you. Um, I believe I corrected Mr. Kelleher on this several months ago when he brought it up, but I'll remind him again that the former DSS building was not sold for a dollar. It was sold for $200,000, and that is public record, so just to clear that up. Also, another point of clarification about the $56,000 in the CDBG fund. I don't want the public to think that that money is floating around. That money is held on a line item for the possibility of having to pay interest in 2013. The council openly and publicly discussed the fact that if that money is not needed, we will decide as a body where to reposition that money. So I don't want people to think that there's just money floating around that, you know, haphazardly because that's not the case. Um, I also want to congratulate the wastewater treatment staff, management, and the mayor because the New York State Conference of Mayors has recognized the city of Schenectady for its wastewater treatment combined heat and power project. The program was awarded second place in the population category over 50,000 by NICOM's 27th Annual Local Government Achievement Awards program. And just to share with you more than you ever wanted to know about wastewater, the city installed a 280 kilowatt wa Waukesha? <laughs> Waukesha, oh, Waukesha, well, I know that word, turbocharged lean burn gas engine generator. And the project achieved a $350,000, $100,000 annual savings for the city taxpayers. So congratulations, Mayor. I know you spearheaded this at the beginning um, of your time as mayor, and looks like it's giving back. So good for all of us. Also, I want to announce that there is a course in self-defense that will be offered at the Hibernian Hall on June 7th and 21st from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Master Michelle Smith Donovan will be teaching. She is the owner and operator of Michelle's Way Taekwondo in the Crosstown Plaza. And as the email said, she's super excellent. And the total cost for the two sessions is $10. So um, apparently, this says invite any ladies you wish, so I think it may be limited to ladies. But if you're interested in um, uh, going to the event, contact me by May 25th, and I'll tell you how, that, how you can register. And lastly, uh, we, since the last meeting, had our first graffiti covering uh, uh, a week ago last Saturday. We were up in Mount Pleasant along with the city neighborhood cleanup, so it started. We didn't finish up there, and we we'll keep plugging away at it, but it was, it was a good day, and the rain held off for the most part, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Erickson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, this meeting tonight started off uh, wonderful. Mr. Ed Kozier uh, brought in the students, uh, introduced the four kids uh, of the Schenectady schools. And I think any time we could highlight uh, the kids in our community and the wonderful things they're doing, I think it's wonderful. And uh, one of the young ladies had, had said, you know, one of the benefits of what they liked about their teacher was that, you know, one of those days when they felt like giving up, uh, their teachers were there to say, no, getting back to it. You know, it's, it's all about persistence. Success is about persistence, not necessarily about, you know, how many smarts you have, but how hard you try and to keep to it when, when things don't go your way. And, uh, and then a little later in the presentation, uh, Mr. Riggi was talking about Mike Mietta, the, the, the coach, and a very similar message. 
that he mentored and taught and pushed the kids to keep trying when they weren't playing very well. He probably coached them and pushed them along. And it's uh, kind of two messages tied together. And I think that's a really um, a wonderful thing to kind of highlight in today. Uh, and, and I really want to congratulate all the teachers and the coaches and the mentors of children because that's really what makes the difference, I think, between a child's success in life uh, is how much mentorship and, and uh, people pushing them through the rough patches. And so uh, I want to thank them. So. Thank you. Mr. Kozier. Okay. Ms. Porterfield. Thank you. Um, Yes, I would also like to congratulate the young ladies that, are, that came this evening and to, on the accomplishments that they're making, and especially Brenda Parker for um, winning that award. That's, that's pretty awesome and in a non-traditional, um, uh, in a non-traditional, uh, what's the word I want? Field, career. Career, that's the word I want, thank you. So that was really good, and I, I especially like the fact that they came to do the presentation themselves as opposed to having one of the teachers do it, and so that was, that was really nice to see. Um, I'd like to announce that while we all know that the Capital District Community Loan Fund has uh, opened an office in Schenectady at 920 Albany Street, and they're going to be there doing their annual spring tour on May 21st from 4 to 6 p.m., and they're going to be beginning at Albany, uh, 920 Albany Street. And the tour is going to highlight uh, some of the affordable housing sites, mixed building use, uh, uh, the Community Justice Center in Schenectady. And they're going to travel from stop to stop and just enjoy some refreshments and, um, and talk about you know, what the Community Loan Fund is doing here in Schenectady. You know, if people had questions about the different projects that they've done. So this is an opportunity to go on the tour and to see some of the projects. So again, it's going to start at 920 Albany Street and on May 21st, and it's from 4 to 6 p.m. And please arrive promptly. Um, so um, if anyone is interested in that, they can get in touch with the Community Loan Fund um, because they want to make sure that they have enough refreshments and uh, they have enough, be able to accommodate all the people that show up. So people should register for that. Also, as our students are coming home for, from college or students that are located in college, I just want to um, just make note of a job opportunity, and I won't say the name of the company, but they can contact me. Um, so there's, there's an opportunity for students to make up to thirteen fifty an hour during the, um, the summer, uh, working first, second, and third shift. There is something that you have to, you have to qualify by being enrolled in college full-time and have something that um, says that you will be returning next semester. So this is an opportunity that's local for our students and it's going to be from May to August. So if folks want, to, if you students who are interested want to reach out to me, I'll give them, give them that information. Um, you know that during the summer it's difficult, a lot of students want to work and we don't always have job opportunities. So when I came across this job opportunity, I thought I would take the opportunity to share it. Again, it's for college students who are full time and returning to college again this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kozier. Boy, what a perfect segue. Let's keep talking about the kids here. And uh, you talk about this, the company. Um, again, the, the Chamber of Scotty County, the Youth Bureau, and SGTA are continuing to do the sponsor a, a student uh, for summer youth employment uh, for $1,000. Uh, that will, you'll be able to sponsor one student, and we'll give you two students for the price of one. Um, this uh, past couple of weeks, we had over 600 applicants of uh, youth from the ages 14 to 21 apply for summer jobs this year, and we have funding for less than 200. Uh, it's a very, very sad situation. We're, we're trying to work as hard as we can uh, with our businesses. Uh, things are picking up right now. The Chamber's doing a great job uh, sponsor, you know, uh, getting the word out to our businesses. And I think we've got about 20 plus uh, folks on board right now. I think the mayor is talking about it as well. We've got the town of Niskayuna jumping on board with this. So again, if you can reach out to that business, we'd love to uh, talk with them. Contact the Chamber. Uh, Sue Rank, if anybody's listening out there, small businesses, large businesses, we uh, just are looking for sponsorships for our kids. And uh, continuing on the kids, uh, next Tuesday, uh, May 20th, it's a school budget vote. Uh, very, very important that we get folks out there to vote. Uh, the polls are open from noon until uh, 9 p.m. Uh, the Board of Education did a, a great job with a very difficult budget this year. Uh, they ended up with a 2.5% uh, impact on the tax levy. Uh, but the good news is uh, our uh, state legislator, our state leaders, are uh, offering a tax rebate for that increase this year. So, for example, a home that's assessed at 
$4,000, there's approximately a $60 uh, additional fee. Uh, New York State is refunding that entire uh, check back to you, of course, just before election time, which is very convenient. Um, but it's being refunded back to you in the form of a rebate for those of us who have the STAR or the Anston STAR uh, requirements. Uh, you'll be expecting a check uh, in the mail uh, for the entire tax rebate of, uh, again, $60 per $100,000. Um, also a reminder, this weekend is our uh, annual Woodlawn Neighbors Association Community Garage Sale. Uh, last year we had over 200 homes that participated. Uh, it's this weekend, the 17th and 18th, and uh, the permits are available at uh, Grassel's Barbershop on Albany Street or at the uh, Sunoco Food Mart, uh, also on Albany and Route 7. Uh, they're $10 a piece. And uh, the maps are also going to be available that morning. So again, we had over 200 homes participating last year. So again, we're looking for a great turnout. So if you want to take a cruise through Woodlawn and grab some uh, great items, stop by for the garage sale. And uh, finally, if I may, the um, Skunky County tomorrow night uh, in their legislative uh, meeting is uh, making, uh, they're receiving an award to create uh, Skunky County as a Purple Heart County. Uh, I think it's a very a wonderful opportunity for the uh, folks who uh, have uh, received the Purple Heart and, of course, for all our veterans, men and women, who have represented us. But I've talked with uh, the mayor and with uh, President King. I'd like to put on our agenda next uh, week or so uh, the fact to try to get the city of Schenectady as a Purple Heart City. Uh, Bill Frank, who is the uh, director of uh, Veterans Affairs, thought it was a great idea. There's very few cities in New York State that have their recognition. And we have the purple light shining on City Hall now for aut uh, autism awareness. We'd like to keep that purple heart shining for the month of uh, June and, in fact, do an official uh, resolution uh, when it's uh, National Purple Heart Day on uh, August 7th. So I hope we can get that on the uh, committee cycle uh, for next week, if we may. And uh, finally, again, thank you to the Steinmetz Career Center for being here. There are plenty of cupcakes left out in the hallway, from what I understand. So please take them home uh, with you. And we want to thank all the students uh, for being here today. Thank you. Absolutely. OK, anyone else? Mr. Rigby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'd like to thank the, uh, the school kids that came down tonight. I mean, the, my wife's going to be very happy when I come home. I know that. Uh, the stuff looks delicious. Um, I just want to make an observation of um, something that I read in the paper, and the reason it kind of caught me by surprise was we met Monday night in executive session for quite a while in claims, and then 10 hours later I pick up the paper, and on A1, in big headlines, is a notice of claim is filed against the city for sexual harassment. I'd just like to, I think it'd be the right thing to do is to apprise the city council and the claims committee when something like this is coming down. I don't want to read it in the paper. I could see maybe if it was four days away, maybe if it, the story broke on a Friday, I can understand that, but obviously it was known that the notice of claim was filed, and I think uh, it's only right that the city council is surprised of this without reading it before they read it in the paper, because I was flabbergasted when I read that. And uh, it's a serious allegation. I hope we get to the bottom of it. Uh, but anyhow, that's my only observation with that. I'd like to know uh, when there's a serious claim like that filed. That isn't a, you know, a little accident. That's something very serious. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Mr. Rigby, that came in late in the day. Uh, we can uh, spend most Monday evenings. I can keep you here until midnight doing briefings on stuff that are going on. But uh, again, is you, uh, your word choice that is an allegation, and is that uh, policy of the city we don't comment on pending lawsuits, but uh, full review will document, I think, an appropriate response by the city in that, uh, again, allegation. Uh, it was brought up to bring parking meters to Upper Union Street. That is completely incorrect. There's no basis for that, and it is just, uh, I believe, inappropriate rhetoric to try and uh, shift the debate away from what we're actually trying to do to manage parking in downtown. Uh, we had a uh, fire this morning at 822 State Street, been a problem property. That property has been demolished. We'll get it, uh, I think they'll move it out of there tomorrow. So the Department of Labor uh, is a little bit uh, slow sometimes in granting some of the permits. But uh, we do take those seriously and uh, work in a manner that uh, tries to uh, maintain value in the neighborhoods. It's what the overall plan is. 
again, you know, talk about the land bank and other things. Sometimes we have to acknowledge the land bank put in a weak application for state funding. And just have to deal with that. Uh, the Attorney General's office has been very uh, cooperative in working with uh, the community. Gave us the $150,000 planning grant. It's laying the groundwork for, again, a substantial investment of those funds in this community. And it's coordinating it, not only with our Section 108 loan, but with the land bank with money we spend otherwise, and then with private investment that we're bringing in the community. It's a complicated uh, uh, manner that we're doing the planning. Uh, there are complicated structures where there's title issues. Uh, this one today, I think the individual owns a number of properties in Montgomery County, uh, may own as many as four in the city of Schenectady. I think he's currently incarcerated in state prison. All of them are uh, commitments of resources where I know this morning uh, Commissioner Bennett, myself, other staff members probably going to be doing other things, but we spent a considerable amount of time tracking that down, managing that, uh, making sure the property was demolished and that it is uh, dealt with in a timely manner so that we're sending out the message that we're not going to tolerate this, that we're dealing with it as best we can. And so I appreciate uh, the Council's cooperation on this. Uh, where you have issues or things are not uh, provided to you, can I tell you, you've got to call me and we'll turn it around as quick as we can. But I don't expect, it, sometimes it's hard to tell just what the priority of the council is. And I expect the staff, there's so many things we're trying to do, trying to juggle so many things because there are problems and there are also opportunities. There's a lot of good things happening here. And that I expect the staff to uh, keep all the balls in the air and uh, sometimes it doesn't always happen that way, or we're not quite successful on that. But if it doesn't, I want to know about it. And in this whole process, I have not had uh, one call from any of the council members. You know, Councilmember Porterfield sent an email around, which again uh, sent it back to staff. And apparently, the email is still slow in getting the information out to you. But I want to make sure you have the information that you want and uh, allows you to uh, make the appropriate decision and. Uh, function in your appropriate role. Again, uh, thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to address the council and the community. Thank you. Uh, our next city council meeting is going to be on Wednesday night, Wednesday, May 28th, 2014, uh, because the council chambers are being used for the, by the Board of Assessment Review. So with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Riggi, seconded by Mr. Kozier. All in favor? Aye. Aye.